Welcome to our deep dive into Oedipus Rex, one of the most powerful tragedies in literature. In this video, you'll learn the full, heart-wrenching story of Oedipus the King and understand the profound theme of fate versus free will. We'll explore modern interpretations and delve into the ancient Greek perspective on these concepts. You want to master the intricacies of this timeless debate and fully grasp the tragic journey of Oedipus? Make sure to watch until the very end. Join us as we unravel the complexities of fate, free will, and their impact on one of literature's most tragic heroes. But before the story, I would request you to like the video and subscribe the channel to help us reach the first thousand subscribers goal. In one of Greece's most esteemed kingdoms, a boy was born to the king and his young, beautiful queen. However, this birth was far from a joyous occasion. During a visit to Apollo's temple, the king received a chilling prophecy. His newborn son would one day be the cause of his death and the downfall of his entire family. Desperate and terrified, the king decided that the child must be sacrificed for the greater good. He persuaded the queen that their son's life had to end. The king entrusted the infant to a loyal servant, instructing him to take the child to Mount Citheron. Baby's feet were pierced and a rope was threaded through them. The servant was to hang the child from a tree by his feet, leaving him to the mercy of the wild beasts. But the servant's heart could not bear such cruelty. Instead of abandoning the baby, he handed him to a passing shepherd. This shepherd, a humble and kind man, untied the child's feet and tended to his wounds. He named the baby Oedipus, meaning swollen feet. Yet, the shepherd was very poor and knew he couldn't raise the child himself. The shepherd, unable to raise the child himself, took him to the king of Corinth, Polybius. Polybius and his wife, childless and yearning for a son, decided to adopt the boy and named him Oedipus. As Oedipus grew, he became handsome, strong, and exceptionally intelligent, living a happy life as the crown prince of Corinth. However, during a grand celebration, a nobleman cruelly taunted Oedipus, claiming he was unworthy of the throne because he was a foreigner. Disturbed by this accusation, Oedipus confronted King Polybius, demanding the truth. The king dismissed the nobleman's words as the ravings of a drunk, but Oedipus was not satisfied. Determined to uncover his origins, he sought answers from the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle did not reveal his past but instead foretold a horrifying fate. Oedipus would kill his father, marry his mother, and bring shame upon his descendants. Horrified and desperate to avoid this destiny, Oedipus decided to leave Corinth, believing it would save his beloved parents from his cursed fate. Heartbroken and aimless, Oedipus wandered the roads of Greece. At a narrow crossroads he encountered a lord in a wagon accompanied by his servants. One of the servants aggressively shoved Oedipus off the road to make way for the wagon. Infuriated, Oedipus struck the servant with his cane. The lord and his remaining servants attacked. But Oedipus, driven by a mix of fear and fury, fought them all. His youth and strength prevailed, leaving the Lord and his servants dead, save for one who fled. Triumphant, Oedipus felt a surge of power. His victory over multiple opponents bolstered his confidence. Continuing his journey, he soon heard of a monstrous creature terrorizing the kingdom of Thebes. Emboldened by his recent success, Oedipus decided to confront the fearsome Sphinx hoping to add his name to the pantheon of heroes. Decipher me, or I'll devour you. She would then present a riddle, and those who failed to solve it were mercilessly devoured. Thebes, mourning the death of King Laius, was provisionally ruled by Creon who had lost his own firstborn to the Sphinx. In desperation, Creon declared that whoever could defeat the Sphinx would marry his sister, Jocasta, the widowed queen, and become the king of Thebes. Oedipus, fearless and willing to risk death to ensure his parents' safety from the dreadful prophecy, accepted the challenge. He confronted the Sphinx, who posed her infamous riddle. In the morning, I have four legs, at noon two, and in the twilight three. Among all creatures, I alone change my number of legs, but the more I have, the weaker and slower I become. The Sphinx, already anticipating another easy meal, licked her lips in anticipation. Oedipus, however, calmly responded, The answer is the human being. At the dawn of life, a person crawls on hands and knees. In adulthood, they walk on two legs. In old age, they rely on a cane. Upon hearing the correct answer, the Sphinx was overcome with unbearable shame. 
Unable to endure her defeat, she threw herself from the top of a cliff, ending her reign of terror. Thebes was saved, and Oedipus became its hero, unwittingly edging closer to the tragic destiny foretold by the oracle. After defeating the dreadful Sphinx, Oedipus was rewarded with the hand of Queen Jocasta in marriage, thus becoming the king of Thebes. Jocasta, though of a certain age, remained beautiful and fertile, and together they had four children, the sons Ediocles and Polynices, and the daughters Antigone and Ismene. For many years they lived happily, and Oedipus was regarded as a just and benevolent ruler, despite his flaws. But dark clouds began to gather over Thebes, heralding an impending catastrophe. A devastating plague ravaged the city, claiming countless lives. The desperate citizens turned to their king, who had once saved them, and begged Oedipus to deliver them from this new calamity. Oedipus, resolute and responsible, sent his trusted friend and brother-in-law, Creon, to consult the Oracle of Delphi to uncover the cause of their suffering. Creon returned with the grim news. Apollo has decreed that we must cleanse the land of Thebes, tainted by a heinous crime. Plague will persist until the murderer of King Laius, former king of Thebes, is expelled from the city. The oracle revealed that Laius had been slain by a band of thieves at a crossroads, but their identities remained unknown. Determined to save his city once more, Oedipus declared his commitment to uncovering the murderer's identity. Anyone who knows the true identity of the killer, must come forward without fear of retaliation, regardless of who the perpetrator may be. You will be duly rewarded for your honesty. The murderer surrenders willingly, his life will be spared, he will only face the exile demanded by the oracle. Oedipus vowed to pursue the culprit relentlessly. I will not rest until the man responsible for Laius's death is found and banished from Thebes, even if he is part of my court or my family. May the gods inflict upon him the full measure of pain and suffering he deserves. As the search for the murderer commenced, the ominous prophecy that had driven Oedipus from Corinth began to cast its dark shadow over his life in Thebes, inching him ever closer to a tragic realization. Creon suggested summoning Tiresias, the old blind seer renowned for his clairvoyant ability. Believing that Tiresias could reveal the murderer, Oedipus eagerly summoned him. When Tiresias arrived, Oedipus implored, Wise elder, your reputation as a clairvoyant precedes you. Help us uncover the identity of Laius' killer. I command you to reveal everything you know. Iresius troubled responded, Terrible is the knowledge that only brings misery. Let me go my king, bear your own burden, and let me bear mine. It would be better for both of us. Oedipus, growing impatient, insisted. If you know the killer's identity, reveal it now. Do not allow Thebes to suffer due to your silence. You don't know what you ask, Teresius replied gravely. Such knowledge will only bring ruin. My mouth knows nothing that will help you. Incensed by what he saw as betrayal, Oedipus accused, How dare you betray the soil that welcomed you? Only a complicit man would withhold such knowledge. Deeply offended, Teresius finally spoke the truth. You have insisted on seeking your own destruction. Know this, the wicked one who defiles our city is you, king of Thebes. Oedipus, enraged, shouted, Take this madman away, he speaks nonsense. Tiresias unyielding replied, You demanded the truth and now you must endure it. The curse you have summoned will reveal its fruit. What is said is said. Fuming with anger, Oedipus turned his wrath on Creon, accusing him of treason. This traitor must be in collusion with Tiresias, conspiring to steal my crown. Thus, suspicion and paranoia took root in Oedipus's heart, driving a wedge between him and those he once trusted, as the prophecy's shadow loomed ever darker over his life. Why do you impose such burdensome accusations on me so carelessly? Creon retorted, I have always been your friend and helped make you king. I don't desire your crown. Standing by your side, I enjoy all the benefits of royalty without bearing the heavy burdens of kingship. I have never had the ambition to take your throne. Queen Jocasta, witnessing the escalating tension, attempted to calm her husband and brother. However, Creon, deeply offended, walked away in fury. Husband, don't pay heed to that old charlatan's words, Casta pleaded. Soothsayers and oracles no longer hold the power they once did. It was prophesied that Laius would be killed by his own son, yet he died when that child was just a baby. 
At that moment, a messenger from Corinth arrived, bearing news. My lord, I bring sad tidings from Corinth. Your father has passed away. You must return to your beloved city and claim your throne as the rightful heir. Oedipus felt a mix of sorrow and relief. The news is indeed sad, but it also brings me relief. The oracle predicted I would kill my father and marry my mother. It seems their words are no longer to be trusted. The old king of Corinth died without my intervention. But what if my father died of sadness and despair after I left him? Oedipus continued, conflicted. It wouldn't be wise to return to Corinth and risk fulfilling the prophecy by marrying my mother. Do not worry, my king, the messenger reassured him. The queen of Corinth is not your real mother. She simply adopted you. Oedipus startled asked, How do you know this secret? Because I was the one who handed you to her when you were just a baby, messenger revealed. You were given to me when I was crossing these lands with my flock. Your feet had been pierced. Upon hearing this, Jocasta felt a deep tightness in her heart. Oedipus, now desperate for answers, pressed further. Would you recognize the man who handed me to you if you saw him again? It is vital for me to know my true parents' identities. I must prevent my prophecy from bringing them misfortune, just as I must uncover the identity of Laius's murderer. This is my duty to Thebes and to myself. Jocasta, overwhelmed with dread, crumbled into tears and fled to her room. Oedipus failed to grasp the reason for his wife's hysterical reaction, assuming Jocasta feared the humble origins of his parents could tarnish her family's name. While Oedipus was speaking with the messenger, he was informed that the only witness to Laius's murder had been brought to the court. The servant of the former king stood pale and trembling before Oedipus. The messenger pointed him out, saying, Lord, I have no doubt this is the man who handed you to me when you were just a baby. Turning to the servant, Oedipus demanded, Servant, this man says you handed him a baby many years ago. Lord, pay no attention to this man. The servant stammered, He is just wasting your time. Do you remember that small boy with wounded feet? Oedipus prayed. Now he stands before you as king. Why don't you shut your mouth, you fool? The servant retorted desperate. Who handed you the child? Was it your father? I don't know what this man is talking about servant insisted, panic rising. If I have to repeat the question, you will be a dead man. Oedipus threat. Please do not harm an old man. The servant pleaded. I curse the day I spared your life. It would have been better if you were dead. Speak now and end this. I beg you, my king, the servant whimpered. Don't ask me anything else. You will speak the truth whether you want to or not. Tie him to that trunk, Oedipus commanded, his voice cold. Faced with the threat, the servant finally broke. Considering your command, I yield. What I am about to say will be cruel, but your pain in hearing it will be even greater. You were given to me by Queen Jocasta, who placed in my arms her son with King Laius, so that he could be left to die on Mount Citheron to prevent the fulfillment of a terrible prophecy. In that moment of revelation, light pierced the darkness that had shrouded Oedipus. Prophecy had been fulfilled. While trying to escape his fate, Oedipus had unwittingly embraced it. His father Laius had died by his hand at the crossroads, and he had married his own mother, Ducasta. But Oedipus's full misery had yet to be reached. In her despair, Queen Jocasta had committed a desperate act. Oedipus rushed to the royal chambers, but the door was locked. Pounded on it, calling out her name, his heart heavy with the weight of the truth. Oedipus gently laid Jocasta's lifeless body on the floor then removed the golden brooches from her dress. Using their sharp needles, he pierced his own eyes, crying out, Cursed be my eyes that have seen such horror. I blind myself, so I never have to face my parents in the afterlife. Now blind, Oedipus addressed the people of Thebes, saying, I have taken my own sight. What beauty or joy remains for me in this life? Send me into exile far from Thebes, for I am cursed, most forsaken of mortals by the gods. He handed his crown to Creon, his brother-in-law, who would rule the kingdom until Oedipus's children were old enough to take the throne. Stripped of his kingship, Oedipus was led to the city gates by his children. His daughter Antigone, offering her arm, chose to accompany her suffering father into exile. For Oedipus, having Antigone by his side was a small solace amid his torment. A hint, that the gods might finally pity a man so harshly punished from the start of his life. 
Blind and broken, he left Thebes, no longer a king, but a tragic figure marked by an unrelenting fate. The theme of fate versus free will in Oedipus the King. Oedipus the King masterfully explores the theme of fate versus free will, presenting a tragic narrative where the protagonist's efforts to change his destiny only lead him to fulfill it. Oedipus's story is a powerful illustration of the ancient Greek belief that fate is an unchangeable force orchestrated by the gods and communicated through oracle. Despite his noble intentions and proactive measures, Oedipus's attempts to exercise free will are ultimately futile against the predetermined course of his life. His journey from trying to avoid the prophecy to unwittingly fulfilling it emphasizes the limits of human agency and the inevitability of fate. Each decision Oedipus makes, driven by his free will, paradoxically leads him closer to the tragic destiny foretold by the oracle. The interplay between fate and free will in the play highlights a central irony. The very actions Oedipus takes to assert control over his life are the ones that seal his fate. His tragic downfall, marked by his self-blinding and exile, serves as a poignant reminder of the Greek worldview that while humans can make choices, they cannot escape their fated outcome. The enduring relevance of this theme resonates with modern audiences, reflecting the timeless nature of the questions it raises about human existence, responsibility, and the power of forces beyond our control. Oedipus's tragic journey continues to evoke deep emotional responses, underscoring the profound sadness and complexity of the human condition in the face of fate and free will.